Good morning. morning. Wonderful to see you. Thank you for joining us in worship. It's great to gather together, but it's great to also be able to reach out to folks who are joining us online. So whether you're joining us from any of our social platforms, we want to warmly welcome you as well. Uh, Particularly if you watch on YouTube, we'd like to invite you to subscribe just because that enables us through the metrics uh, to become a bit more visible and hopefully reach more people. We've had stories recently of folks who've been helped in the likes of care homes. And we also invite anybody who has benefited and being blessed by the ministry here um, to write in to let us know what we can always do with some more good news of how the gospel is reaching folks. You can email at epcnotices at gmail.com and we'd love to hear your story. Uh, the Guild meets on Wednesday at 2 p.m. where the guest speaker will be... Oh, it's me. <laughs> Just so used to reading that. Um, so I'm going to speak a wee bit about the boxing outreach that we started in the church and um, I'll bring some of the pads and gloves and maybe the guild can have a go. We'll see. <laughs> um, they'll be having a fundraiser on the 30th of October where the Midgies will be providing entertainment. Some tickets are still available. They are £4 and can be obtained from the guild members or in the hub and all are welcome to join. Just to intimate, the funeral of Helen Forbes will take place on Saturday, the 26th of October at 11.30 a.m. at Clyde Bank Crematorium. There will be no junior church uh, this morning. Junior church will resume next Sunday on the 27th of October. Um, Please keep in mind that next Sunday there's the time change, so we'll be falling back an hour and uh, enjoy the extra hour. Our services on 17th of November will be our new member service. We'll be welcoming those who are joining the church by profession of faith, but also making note of those who have come on by resolution of Kirk session uh, or by transference. We hope you can join us to celebrate uh, the growth that we are able to give thanks for in the church. The Springfield Cambridge Chorus and Orchestra are presenting Rejoice and Sing, their annual Christmas concert in the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall on Monday the 23rd of December at 7.30pm. All proceeds from the concert will go to Chaz Children's Hospices across Scotland. We are planning to run a bus from the church leaving around 6.15pm and the approximate cost for the ticket, the concert and the bus will be around 30 quid. So anyone wishing to attend should speak to Janet Cameron as soon as possible. And I've got one more intimation. Thank you to Erskine Brownies for the generous donation of £250. <clears throat> Let's begin worship. I'm going to read a few verses from the scriptures in Psalm 115. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the human race. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. And so we begin to worship God together by singing in Mission Praise 857, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. There'll be a short musical introduction after which, if we're able to stand and sing along to the words on the screen, I, the Lord, the Sea of Sky.
As we further worship God, we bring him our prayers of confession, and as we do each week, we'll gather up our prayers by saying the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we acknowledge you as our creator, the one who gives us each breath, and indeed everything that we have comes from you, from your good, generous, and gracious hand. We come to take place in the ceremony, the ritual for which we were made, to give glory to our creator, to give praise to him who has revealed his great bounty and his love to us who has called us into relationship with himself. And we come, O oh Lord, to lay down that which so often separates us from you, <coughs> whether it is our burdens of anxiety and fear and lack of faith, whether it is the patterns of wrongdoing that we seem to continually fall into, whether it is distrust and distance from our fellow image bearers, the other people you've put us in relationship with. We know all of this goes back to such an old story, to the original rebellion <coughs> where mankind broke away from you and from the perfect fellowship which you <coughs> created them to live in. They broke away from you and felt fearful and alien and wondered really what God thought of them, and then had suspicion and mistrust of what other people thought of them. And in a sense, that's the story that we find ourselves so often stuck in. And so, God, we thank you for the glorious gospel, which comes to heal us of our very deepest needs, the plagues that are everywhere where we look in our world, suspicion, distrust, falling out, dissension, division. And we don't need, need to look far beyond our own immediate circles and certainly not beyond the church to find that. And so, oh God, have mercy upon us for the part that we play, however small or great, in these things which are so far from the design for which you've made us. For you made us in holiness. You made us for harmony. And we ask, O oh God, this morning that you would speak to us, that you would provide us the forgiveness of sin, which we are assured of in Christ's gospel. And more than that, that you would also, by your Holy Spirit, come and heal our hearts. <coughs> that you would help us to taste something of that restoration and harmony, which you promise in the gospels, the harmony which we were originally made for, that we would know that we are accepted and loved by God through Jesus Christ. That he sees his son having cloaked all our faults and feelings. And that through his son, he gives us the power to be one people. To be united, to be strengthened together by the bonds of God's love. Hear us now as we call on the words that our Lord taught his disciples. Our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We sing again to God's praise. And mission praise number 151, for I'm building a people of power.
we're finishing off our very short series, uh, three out of three, on the membership of the body, where we explore what it is to come into church membership, and particularly what the biblical basis for that is. And so today we're going to finish off by looking at Paul's great words in Galatians chapter 5 about church unity. So I'm going to ask Ken McIntosh to come forward and read for us the Old and the New Testament passages for today. The first reading is from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so that you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The second reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. Life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be de destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But you are to be led by the Spirit. You are, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. May the Lord bless this reading from his holy word.
came across some tweets this week by the flight operator Ryanair. And basically it was them being rude and mean to their customers. And you know what? It worked. <laughs> Do you know why? Because that is part of Ryanair's brand. You go onto a Ryanair flight and you expect to be charged through the nose, to pay an arm and a leg for the basics, you expect not much leg room, all of those things. And so for them to then have their social media and their communications be a bit, a bit abrupt and abrasive, it's what people expect from it. And so it actually, in, in fact, helps them. It increases their brand awareness. But it wouldn't work for British Airways. And might I add, the same thing probably wouldn't work for the church. Ryanair have been come, become known for the wrong things, but they've made it work for them. What do you think are the wrong things that the church is known for? It hasn't changed much. I'll give you a clue. It's the same stuff that Paul was dealing with in Galatia. Paul is so often in the New Testament letters writing to a church that's in a mess. And I don't know whether you think things have changed much, but the central problem, pro problem in Galatia is the division that's been caused and stirred up. And when I'm speaking to folks outside the church today, that's a really common refrain. Why should any of us from outside the church take you seriously when you can't seem to agree among yourselves? When you've got so many historic battles, and as I said to you before, I come from the part of the world that really specializes in creating new identities of church and falling out with other ones. So I know that we've got form for this, but it's a really bad look. We're not Ryanair. It doesn't work because centrally, we are supposed to be about a man that's come to earth to show us what God is like and then did that so powerfully that he united a people around him which could come from radically different backgrounds and persuasions and personalities and put them all together and demonstrate the perfect love of Jesus to each other. That's what it's supposed to be about. And I don't think it's worth giving up on. And my aspiration and hope would be here as we look to welcome more people into the family of the church, that we continue to lean into the original ideal, that we dust it off and we continue to try and figure out what God would actually have us be, what church membership is actually supposed to look like, that it's supposed to look like unity. And the challenges we face are very different. Paul's, I think we did, did we do Galatians this year or last? I can't remember. But we did Galatians and we considered how there are folks who are really upset that Paul is saying you don't need to be circumcised because uh, Christianity starts almost as an outgrowth of Judaism. It's seen as quite a radical new sect. And Judaism had special religious protections at the time. So if you were fully in with the ritualization of it, you didn't get as much heat from the Roman Empire to have to fall in with their kind of pagan worship. And that acted as a blanket and a covering. And we don't know the exact circumstances. Everything we figure out is by inference. But the inference seems to be that there are guys coming along saying, don't listen to Paul. Jesus isn't enough. You also need this other stuff because can you please do it? Because that'll take the heat off us. And Paul is saying, if you go along with that and you continue to not only believe that, that Jesus isn't enough, but if you continue to fight and squabble over it, and there's some evidence in Galatians 5 that it's on the verge of becoming physical violence, then you're going to completely destroy what it is you're supposed to, the image of what it is you're supposed to be believing in to this pagan world about you. You are saying that you have the light of the world and you're ready to have a square go at each other outside the church building. So that's the problems that we have here. What are we going to do today in terms of when we're faced with division and how can we lean into the unity that Paul talks to us about? Well, I want to look at it. Alyssa's, I think, put the points on your bulletin if you want to follow along. Firstly, we're going to look at how love fulfills the law, particularly thinking of the Old Testament and the Torah. Secondly, how love is essentially what is the marker of a Christian? How it's evidence of God's spirit at work in us. And thirdly and lastly, how love is the cure for the ills that plague us as humans. Love fulfills the law. You, my brothers and sisters, in verse 13, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. 
And of course, that's the famous quote that Ken read for us. It comes from Leviticus. One of the most common misconceptions about Christianity is that the God of the Old Testament is um, continually violent and angry and doesn't really have any grace or mercy. And then Jesus comes along and is very kind and loving and he kind of changes the whole game. And that's, it's actually an ancient heresy. It's as old as the church itself. But if we read the Old Testament carefully, we find uh, an awful lot about the heart of God and its, uh, his compassion and particularly his injunction for us to be generous and compassionate towards our neighbours. That is the sum of the Old Testament in a way, and particularly the law. The law was given to the Israelite people to reveal God's character to them. And by keeping it, it was supposed to be a reflection of God's character. It was supposed to be a reminder to them of who the God was that they were serving and his identity. And it was also supposed to be a marker to the people around them of what their God was like. And what Paul is saying here is if you've understood it correctly, even those of you who were in the congregation in Galatia who think you know your Old Testament really well, you're the scholars amongst you, you've kind of missed the point if you don't think that love for your neighbor is not a central part of that as mandated by God. Love for neighbor, love for God and neighbor is the sum total of that law. Jesus said this, of course, famously. Now, Jesus, why did Jesus say this? Because how, it was because of how the law was being used. You see, the preciousness of what we have in God revealing his character and his nature and him giving us his scriptures can be used and abused and often does. And this still happens in the world today. In Jesus' time, when he was prompted to talk about love being the sum total of the law, he, the, he was up against folks who were using the law as a blunt instrument. They were getting annoyed at people who weren't keeping ritual purity laws properly and who weren't tithing their grains of cumin and uh, portions of mint properly. And Jesus was saying, you've completely missed the point. You're obsessing over those things, which are small beer by comparison to the great injunction and revelation that God is love and that the law that he's given is saturated in his love. Do you see? For him and for other people. And Paul's dealing with a kind of myopic vision where folks are able to see the importance of so many things but completely miss the point. Missing the wood for the trees. And that's what Jesus was doing too. And further, there's an injunction. Do not use that law and pick up bits of it and say thou shalt not and thou shall if you're not very good at doing what you're, the main thing you've been asked to do is, which is love, because that's the whole point of the law. And why was the law even given? The law was given originally to create a people that were liberated and ransomed and God bought and freed from slavery in Egypt. So an act of divine love. And then they were set as a people and given an identity and they were to be put in a land which would then reflect the love that God released his people with, but that they would then continue in. The law was given so that ultimately they as a society could live in harmony and in holiness. That they would be able to live alongside one another, that they would be able to uh, minimize dissension and squabbles and hierarchies, that they would be able to centralize the worship of God and always give the proper place to acknowledging his holiness, but then that there would be an emanating outwards of that and that the people would be holy, separate, set apart, exemplary in the love of God, which is what it was all about. And we still face these problems, but we'll think about them a little bit more in the other points. Suffice it to say that if we have a sort of a pair of specs and we read the law of the Old Testament or um, the first five books of Moses or any other part of the book and we see something guiding all of it as anything other than love, and that can be lots of things. It can be fear, it can be judgment, it can be righteousness or self-righteousness. Now, 
all of those things are good. Um, sorry, no, fear and so on aren't. But the likes of righteousness is good. But we shouldn't pit different aspects of God's character and nature against the others. And we should also always try and go with the grain of what has he said is really important. We bang on a lot about love because God quite properly has said that should be the apex through which we interpret everything else. And dear friends, why do we keep needing to be reminded of that? Because we have a problem where we easily forget love where it's quite easy to set it aside and to think and focus on other things as being the most important. To forget to have that as the guiding ethic of either our lives or of the church's life or of a denomination's life. There are so many other things that can come in, but if we're following, if we want to be biblical and follow the letter of the law, if that's the way we want to be, then the guiding ethic or the guiding motivation for everything has to be love because that's what the law is all about. And then secondly, love is evidence of God's spirit at work. So I say, verse 16, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another. The flesh is all that is not of God. Um, it's, it's an awkward word to translate, but the flesh, it, it, you and I think of meat and of the, you know, the bodily suits that we're in. But here Paul's using it as a sort of in, in opposition to what comes from God's life-giving spirit. And if we, I'll go outside of the text just for a wee bit to get to the idea of God's spirit all through. There's a really nice study you can do where you can trace the work of God's spirit all through the scriptures. And it starts right at the beginning of book of the book where uh, the spirit of God hovers over the waters and um, begins to bring order from the chaos, the primeval chaos in creation. And then the spirit of God breathes life into man and so on and so forth. The spirit of God keeps showing up and being at work to bring life and to bring energy and to bring fullness to the creation. So the spirit of God is properly life-giving. It is what animates and in a very real way, what humanizes us, what makes us um, image bearers of the living and the true God and makes us emblems of, of that love and justice and holiness and all the good things that we aspire to. They're because God has breathed his spirit and his life into us. And in the life and the experience of the believer, there's a, a real, usually a real jumping off point. And some of us can't remember it. And some of us came out of the womb singing hymns and praising God. And other of us, like myself, had a fairly dramatic experience of knowing that something had changed and God's spirit is now at work in you. But his point is, is that you are this community who know that God's spirit has done something pretty special in you. That the life of faith that you, you were baptized into, that that is supposed to be somehow distinct. That's supposed to focus on the life-giving love of God that, that really humanizes us and others and that continues to animate our experience of the church in a good and a positive way that builds up um, ourselves and others into better and more uh, intimate knowledge of God and his ways and particularly of experiencing his love. Do you see? And so he's saying, that's the spirit that is at work in you. And what that does is, as you walk in that, then your love should be increasing. Your unity and your bond with others should be increasing. Your, um, he talks about walking by the spirit. The, the, the idea was to, just as you and I put one foot in front of the other, or as I'm doing just now, to walk, that that is how you live out your Christian life, animated and guided by the spirit and the love of God. And as you go, as you make progress on a journey, so you make progress spiritually because the trail of love behind you, if you like, is getting bigger and bigger. How can it not when you have the very spirit of God who is love and has given us and shown us his love as the thing that is guiding you and moving you along? How could it not? Well, apparently it cannot because when Paul gives his, if you like, the, the dodgy list 
from verse 19 of all the bad things. He says at the end, I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So picture this. You've got folks who are walking, and they're walking along in their, um, in their life and what they think is their spiritual walk. And they're convinced by whatever credentials that they're walking towards the kingdom of God and the light of God. But putting all of this together, the only way I would say, I'm more and more convinced of this, the only way that we can know that we're walking in this path to inherit the kingdom of God is that we're growing in love and that there's evidence of God's love in our lives and that love translating into real, concrete and practical love for other folks. Because if we're growing in some of the stuff on that list, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, fits of rage, and I'm deliberately picking those ones because there's a point to the way he orders them, then there's not evidence that we're growing in love. And I think I've said this before, but it's possible to be someone who has very high status in the church and in Christianity and is well thought of, well regarded, perhaps even thought of as a great theologian, someone who's very clever and knows their Bible really well and reads a lot of theology books. And it's possible to have all of that and something that you're not really known for is love. You're known for being austere and not particularly gracious and not particularly patient with folks, um, p- perhaps not even particularly pleasant to be around. I, I say that because I think there's something wrong there. I don't think that at all accords. We want to be biblical. I don't think that at all. I, I don't think it matters how much you know. If I speak in the tongues of angels, but I have not love, I'm just a clanging symbol. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter what status. In fact, according to the New Testament, your status shouldn't, in this world, matter at all. It shouldn't matter to you, and it certainly shouldn't be a, some kind of accolade in order to climb a hierarchy over others. That is not the way of love. The only evidence, I would say, of God's spirit that, that something's happened and that you're walking with him is that you, you are growing in love. That the, the list of stuff where you are um, looking to devour other folks and, and be engaged in that, that that's, that's fading away and receding. And of course, this is one letter and yeah, there's... Paul doesn't have all the time in the world. And so there will be a battle and a back and forth. And there'll be times where perhaps these two things are in tension more than the others. But generally, if you look at the trajectory, and I hope, um, friends, this is assuring for you this morning. Because I hope and I'm so confident that for you, if you look back over your life, that you'll be able to plot the dots and go, as I was walking, yeah, I've been growing in love. Or I even perhaps think recently something has happened and my heart has been warmed and I'm beginning to see that actually I am growing in love for others. And I am starting to lose some of those harder edges in terms of the characteristics of how I deal with other people. I'm being softened somehow. Or perhaps that happened a long time ago and you're now, God's spirit is now speaking to you and you're starting to put it together and to go, God has been at work in my life. That's the only explanation for this. And he's now speaking to me and confirming to me that it's his love that has been at work. And it doesn't matter that I don't think of myself highly or I don't have all these other credentials that seem to be important or the other identity markers of what it is to be a Christian because I have love. And that's the identity marker of God's spirit. And so love is the sum total of the law. It's the evidence of God's spirit being at work with us. But lastly, it's what we really need. It's the real cure for our ills. Let's look at this pretty dreadful list. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Right, look at what he's doing with this list because I I think this is the most interesting part of the passage. Those are ones which the folks he's writing to in the church and hopefully most of us would be able to go, oh yeah, see these pagans, the immorality, the impurity, the debauchery, the craziness, the idolatry and witchcraft. 
I don't think any of us are holding seances. So we're able to go, that's for other people. Th those are the folks out there who are doing the stuff that means you won't inherit the kingdom of God, okay? The people at the sex parties and the Ouija boards. But then, in the same list, he has hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envies. We would be lying if we said that those of us within the church never have an issue with those kinds of things on this list. And he's getting to the heart of the fact that the people in this church are saying, well, we've got God's spirit and we've been changed and we're looking outside and we're going, we're not doing the Ouija boards and we're not going to those insane parties anymore. So we're fine. And he's saying, no, 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 you know, you're not fine because you hate other people in your church and you're envious of other people and some of, the, some of what they have. Perhaps you're envious of those teachers and the status and the prow prowess that they have. And you're having fits of rage and outbursts because you think they are so misunderstanding the gospel that what they really need is you to get angry and get in their face and correct them and sort them out. And you really want to use the church as a way to climb a social ladder where perhaps you've never really been anyone in life and you see, oh, well, you know, if I could just become somebody in the church, then, you know, selfish ambition. But it's dressed up in Christianity and in church. And so it looks really good. And it looks like you're just trying to work harder for the kingdom. But really, that's what's going on in your heart. And he's looking at all those different people. And he's saying, there's no difference in terms of the way God sees that from the person who's holding the seance. Because here's the thing that all those things on that list have in common. They're fundamentally dehumanizing. Do you see? Um, sexual immorality is, is, is a junk drawer category that he uses for um, all kinds, anything that was considered taboo in the ancient world. But what it would have had in common from Paul's point of view is using of other people for sexual gratification. Which, so it, it's degrading and dehumanizing to them. Trying to have selfish ambition on the church means that in the within the church means that one is stepping upon other people in order to elevate oneself dissensions and factions my point is so important that it's worth tearing a few strips off of you in order that my point will win and my team and my side will win and he's saying all of that stuff is, is anti-God, it is, it is dehumanizing, it is degrading to the image of God in the other person that you are dealing with. And more than that, it's coming from, if, if stuff isn't coming from the good part of our spirits that God is animating, then it's coming from the other place. It's coming from the, the you-centered bit, the bit that, as Augustine said, is, is turned in on ourselves. The bit that is operating out of a kind of mix of pride and fear. I want to be the best and the greatest and people to see me. Or I'm fearful that I'll be a nobody and people won't see me and they won't think of me as important or that I, I won't be loved. Or So I'll, I'll take part in those things because I'm motivated other something other than the security and the love of God working through me by his spirit. So what's, my goodness, what's the answer to that? Because that's what happens in our world. We're all dealing with the consequences of that all the time, of people, people being motivated by that turned inwards kind of cesspool of pride and fear. And perhaps we take part in ourselves because we're sinners. Look at what he gives us the antidote. But if you're working by God's spirit, you've got love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't have time to break all of those down. So let me summarize them by saying they're the opposite of dehumanizing. These are properly, and uh, this is N.T. Wright's idea, humanizing characteristics. The love, joy, peace, faithfulness, self-control, uh, self gentleness. Those are things that look at other people and go, I'm not going to try and break you down and take and get what I need from you. I don't see you as an accessory to my life and what I want. I see you as an image bearer of God. And what I want is for you to be built up. And so I'm going to deal with you with patience and forbearance and long suffering. I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to believe the best about you. 
I'm going to exemplify the love that God's shown me to you because you're worthy of that, because I'm looking for the best for you to come up, because I am so secure in the love that God's put in me by his spirit that I don't need anything from you. And I don't need you to be down here so that I feel like I'm a bit more up there because I'm already loved and accepted by God. Do you see how the world, our communities, the church would be so different if we felt like this, if we got this? You see, sometimes the fruits of the spirit are shown as bananas and apples, and these are things that you can get better at, like being patient and kind and so on. And I think that's probably quite good for a kid's lesson, because, but really they're the one thing. They're all, they all flow out of this um, God's spirit working within us, humanizing us, and giving us a desire to humanize other people. Now, let me uh, finish on this. Let me show you how that's possible. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Friends, this is not a religion of triharderism. And this is not me saying to you, if you just give this another go this week, then that's not what it's about. We are here because someone has already come and done all of this for us and shown us the way. So Christ came and he wasn't motivated by the flesh. He was motivated and moved by the spirit of God and by his father leading him. And that led him, as he kept in step with God's spirit, to the cross. It led to his death, where he voluntarily gave up and laid down his life for you and me. And that not only paid for our sins, but it showed us what living God's way looks like. It's, it's a death to self. It's a death of the ego. It's not trying to preserve or prove anything about ourselves. It's laying it all down and going, I am secure in who I am in God and in God's plan for me and whatever that means. And that means I don't need to take part in the world's games of trying to uh, compartmentalize and degrade and dehumanize other people. I am free because Christ has set me free and accepted and loved me to love other people. Do you see how he does that by his example and by his death? Because Nothing to him in this life was so precious that kept him back from dying for you and me on the cross. And so he gave us that example of perfect love. And now what the writer to the Galatians is saying, go and do likewise. Die to yourself and to the flesh, not out of sheer exertion, but simply by imitating and copying your savior, Jesus, who you want to talk about, didn't even consider being equal with God, anything to be grasped at, but came down and took the form of a servant. He's saying, you know what, it's, it's okay for you to take the form of a servant. Now, as a church, what this means is we are a redeemed community of people who hopefully have grasped that the whole point and the character and the nature of God and his law is love. And then we have grasped that the evidence that something has happened and we've been touched by God's spirit is that we walk in that love, particularly in love for others as we're dealing with in this chapter. But the way we then do that is by taking note and in a very real way, uh, apprehending the love that was shown by Christ as he died for us in uh, crucifying anything that this world had to offer and that was thought to be worth holding on to and that our world thinks is valuable and worth holding on to at all costs and saying it, it, it doesn't matter because there is nothing that surpasses the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus. And then once we've tasted that and realized that he's bought us with that, we're set free and we're free to love others as he did and as he intended. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen. We respond to God's word by singing again in worship and mission praise number 731. We love the place, oh God. Mission praise 7301. We love the place, oh God.
As we further worship God, we bring him our prayers of dedication for the offering and also of intercession for others. Let us once again come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us so much. We are recipients of your goodness, your love, and your grace. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that our offering may be used, that more people would be able to know and be impacted by the love of God, and particularly that we would be helped in your service to show that love for others, which is the sum total of your law. God, we are grateful that you hear our prayers when we call to you, that our prayers are precious to you. And so we ask that our church as a praying people may also be the hand and the feet of your gospel here on the earth. Lord, would you move the hearts of those who are in authority to make provisions to address the many inequalities we continue to find in our nation. May we continue to find answers to poverty and repression. May we be able to curtail and curb greed at the highest level. We ask you that you may hear all the prayers of those who are afflicted, vulnerable, or oppressed. God, we pray for families today who are struggling to deal with the financial challenges which continue to spiral and make things harder. We pray for the needs of our local community, that you would continue to help us as a church to be motivated to listen to exactly what they are and to meet them as best we can with the resources you've given us. We ask, O oh God, that you would comfort all those who find themselves in states of distress and mourning for whatever reason. Lord, we pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones within our own church family and beyond, that you would be near to them as you promised to be. We ask, O oh Lord, for those who await medical tests and procedures, for those who continue to look anxiously at the future, for those who have a fading sense of hope, we ask that you would be near to them, that as Jesus came aside, uh, beside his disciples and encouraged them with the love and the care of God as the cure for their fretting, that in a very real way, all those who struggle with what the future holds would know that you hold them and that you are near to them and that you care for them. Lord, we pray for those who feel overwhelmed and burned out, whether by work or other commitments, by stresses within family. May you hold them and may you give them rest, repl replenishment and restoration. Lord, we bring those to you whom we are burdened for. Those who perhaps suffer silently, those who struggle to talk about what is going on, those who struggle to take whatever steps would be good for themselves, we lift them to you, O God, and ask in the silence of our prayer in our hearts that you would move in their lives. We ask you to be with us as we move into another week. We ask that you would go before us, protect us and guard us, that we would have an awareness that you are with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. All of this we ask in Christ's name for his sake and his glory. Amen. Our concluding praise is Amazing Grace, um, after which, if you're able to remain standing, I'll close with a benediction. There'll also be a cup of tea and coffee served through in the hub, uh, if you'd like to go through for an uh, informal time afterwards. But our concluding praise is Amazing Grace.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all this day and forevermore.